Thank you, Scarlett. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank, um, whoa, a little bit of an echo. I want to thank, uh, uh, using my EPFL hat, Microsoft for uh, participating and supporting Applied Machine Learning Days. Also Microsoft for, uh, for the past uh, six years supporting uh, a number of key research projects with EPFL and ETH Zurich as part of the Joint Research Center. And then also wearing my ICRC hat, uh, thanking Microsoft for the, uh, the other research uh, that has uh, been happening. What you actually see right now is a confluence of research activities, at the intersection between technology and policy, with the humanitarian sector being a good example of where these two domains I interact and intersect in, in complex and, and perhaps unanticipated ways or in extreme ways. And we'll try to illustrate some of those use cases during this, uh, this panel. And within the humanitarian sector, ICRC is probably uh, one of the best, uh, maybe I'm biased, right, or the best example of, of an actor that uh, has specific privileges and immunities for the right reasons that have been recognized by all of the governments uh, in, in the world uh, that must be, that are constantly challenged by the fact that we now live in a, in a digital environment. So, so the title of my talk is uh, must, rely, must Digital Trust Rely on Conventional Trust or is it the other way around? And, and if, you wait, if, if you want to think about this, right, uh, the question of course does not have an obvious answer. We will probably discuss it further in, in, during the, the panel itself. Uh, my background is not from AI per se, so I'll first talk a little bit about infrastructure, then I'll talk about some of the emergent properties of developments of, of AI as they pertain to the humanitarian sector. But um, we use digital systems, whether they're AI-based or not, they rely on trust. There's an expectation of trust. That expectation on trust, unfortunately, is harder and harder to achieve uh, because the infrastructure is, is getting more and more complex. I'll start with a, a simple example from my own research. Uh, we developed a software solution so that developers can use third-party libraries without having to trust them, or why, by containing how much we need to trust them. And that's kind of an interesting and important problem because there are millions of developers in the world, many contribute to open source projects. The way we actually build cost-effective leading-edge solution is by composing libraries together, and yet, how do we trust them? How can we trust them? And at the end of the day, uh, it's impossible to determine whether software is correct or incorrect, right? That's, in a way, it's a value judgment. Uh, there will be bugs. There will be malicious uh, uh, um, hacks or, or, or backdoors introduced into software. Sometimes difficult to know which, whether it's a bug or it's a deliberate uh, introduction of some backdoor. But nevertheless, what we need is we need to be able to use software without having to depend on on trusting the individual developers. So we should not have to de trust developers that we don't know, and that's one example of, of innovation to sort of slightly raise the bar. Um, there is a very, very well-known hack. In fact, it's one of the motivation for part of this panel session is the SotoFlare hack, which was basically a, an agent running uh, on enterprise network uh, from a reputable company that normally one trusts that turned out to be a vector for us, what is known as a supply chain attack. So should we trust our agents? How do we make sure that we can use agents from other companies without having to fully trust them? Again, it remains uh, an open challenge. Um, uh, we will hear about some of the improvements being put into physical infrastructure and cloud infrastructure. Um, and that is aimed at, again, raising the bar so that um, you do not need to put as much trust in the cloud infrastructure provider because uh, there are some transparency guarantees offered at different levels. But then uh, when we think about a cloud provider, a cloud provider is both a provider of technology, but it's also a company with employees. And these employees can uh, have their own agendas that might be illegitimate, and they may have illegitimate access to data. Uh, I was once talking to a, a good friend of mine who is in, um, in a uh, leading network um, television streaming company without naming it explicitly. And they were asking themselves, how many people could uh, get the playlist of our most visible customers? That's an interesting question that you ask within a company. It's actually quite hard to reduce that to zero. Ideally, the answer should be zero. When in reality, when you operate a software as a service, there is data. The data is in the clear for some, including for some of the operators. 
Uh, for ICRC, this has a, a particularly uh, very, very high degree of importance because some of the data is particularly sensitive. And therefore, we want to make sure that no one can actually have access to the data. And in addition, um, some, uh, the legal system may actually compel the cloud operator to share data with, with, some, government company, with some governments. Right? In particular, the United States has a set of acts called the Patriot Act and the Cloud Act, which compel cloud providers to share data of their customers under a relatively narrow set of circumstances, uh, but typically associated with, with a gag order. So if we look at this chain of, of trust, right, we see that it's, it is very difficult to actually have trustworthy solutions. And of course, at the same time, pragmatically, we use them. So it's important that as we depend more and more on technology, we raise the bar so that we can trust them. Uh, now, specific to AI, AI introduces a whole set of, of, of additional challenges in, uh, in the humanitarian sector. And I'm going to take a very broad definition of AI. Uh, AMLD has, I think, a generally a broad definition of what we consider AI. AI in general is things that can be identified or determined by, by computers, uh, sometimes better or faster than what can be done by humans. Uh, simply because they are ability to process large amounts of data at compute speeds as opposed to the limited amount of IO bandwidth that we as individuals have with our own eyes, right? So that's sort of my, my view of, of, of the AI. And one of the, the challenges with AI is it can be used to process and interpret and make determinations on very personal and sensitive data. And one mature application by this broad definition of AI is, is biometrics. Right? Biometrics can be used for authentication, right? This is our thumbprints on our phones. It can also be used to identify people. And in fact, it's been used more and more to identify people. Um, there is a, that necessarily is neither a good thing or a bad thing. Where it becomes dangerous is when uh, a biometric database is explicitly billed. And at ICRC, when I, when I joined the assembly four years ago, we were started working. We've since then formalized and published a biometric policy, and the main purpose of this biometric policy is to put constraints on how and when ICRC itself is allowed to use biometrics and when it's not allowed to use biometrics. And specifically, uh, we're very pragmatic, right? So sometimes we need to use biometrics because uh, if you want to identify DNA, the remains of, of cadavers, right, uh, from cadavers, right, you basically take human samples and you do DNA sequencing. So that's a form of, of personal biometric genomic information. And that is something we do. But what we've decided not, not to do and never to do is to use biometrics when it's a convenience for ICRC. It has to always be in the direct benefit of the beneficiary or their relatives. Otherwise, we don't use biometrics. So this is a case where, where new technology is emerging. Um, it may come across as relatively innocuous, right? You know, how sensitive is your thumbprint database uh, in the Western world? Well, perhaps it is, of course, personal, right? It is regulated. Um, it may be used more and more as a convenience on some readers and scanners. Uh, but in uh, some countries, of course, it's a matter of, of life and death. Uh, the, other, the second example of where AI is, is a really important point when it comes to the, the humanitarian sector is it creates new use cases and use of technology that directly apply to the core business of ICRC, which unfortunately is war. Uh, and in that, uh, we've made a very clear policy determination, and Baltazar will build on it, about killer robots, right? Uh, weapons can have some degree of uh, guidance uh, and guidance systems that are based on advanced control loops, and, and some might call them artificial intelligence, but at the, same, at the same time, these systems as they exist today are configured, operated, and the decision to kill is, is left to a human person, and we believe that to be absolutely essential. And so the ban on automatic weapons and killer robots is something that is very, very high on the policy agenda of ICRC. Um, and then the third example on AI, which I think is particularly important in the humanitarian sector, but in society in general, is um, it has to do with, uh, with recommendation systems, right? And recommendation systems in particular as applied to social networks. Uh, they are designed and quite effectively, and they've demonstrated their efficacy to uh, optimize engagement, right? And so we actually know how to use AI to optimize engagement by promoting uh, posts that will increase engagement, right? And, and with more engagement, then, you, of course, you can create a profitable revenue model 
uh, for the companies that operate social networks. Um, what's important to recognize is that with this objective, which you, we will argue is a, and we should admit, is a perfectly legitimate business objective to optimize engagement. Uh, at the same time comes a very strong sense of responsibility that some material actually, even though it increases engagement, also has real life consequences. And I think it's very clear that there have been a number of cases in uh, matters of war, in matters of vaccination policy, where, um, where recommendation engines have had a direct impact on outcomes that matter in, in real life. So how do we think about this, right? Um, well, so it is important that policy and technology intersect with each other. Um, this problem is not going away. I don't think we'll find the solution by the end of this panel, right? In fact, I'm quite convinced we will not find a solution within a decade. And the reason for this is that the technology is gonna keep changing and evolving. Uh, the pace of innovation is, if anything, accelerating. Uh, and what's more important, I think it's been demonstrated, is that the adoption at scale of new technologies is faster than we've ever had in human mankind, right? So we go from having a new technology that's sort of barely proven in the lab to something that is running on a billion cell phones in a matter of a few years or months, right? And so this is something that happens at scale in multiple cases, and we will see more and more situations where we have unanticipated behaviors and we need to have ideally the appropriate frameworks and the appropriate conversation. And in this, I think there is a number of key policy decisions that idly should be made. One is to completely change the paradigm on security. Right now, the paradigm of security is it's viewed as a competitive advantage by nation states uh, to manage and keep a track of uh, vulnerabilities for attack purposes. And that paradigm actually, at some point, will actually have to, to shift simply because the value will move elsewhere. And, and hopefully that is also a paradigm shift that is within reach within a, a small amount of time. And the other one is, of course, is to, buy, is to build responsible systems using uh, leading uh, technology and advanced technology. And that's actually um, the best way for me to introduce the two technical speakers of this panel is we're gonna learn about new technologies whose primary goal is to increase the trust by design that we have in these systems without having to trust either the equipment, the software, or the operators. Uh, of, this, uh, uh, of, of those systems. Um, this is something that's very important to, I think, for society, it's very important for, for research, it's also very important for the humanitarian sector. In particular, as uh, from an ICRC perspective, we're now in a position where uh, neutrality itself is being challenged, uh, and the neutral nature of the internet is completely challenged, right, to the point that it's now a given that we're gonna move from one universal internet connecting everyone in a globally open society to something that is splintered, right? Some people call it splinternet, but in general, that split is happening, and neutrality in a split world is something that will be particularly challenging for an organization that does depend on connected technology. Thank you very much. Do you want to take me to take questions now or, or later? Or? No, generally. Okay, later. Okay, so questions will be later. Thank you very much.